It's my pleasure to turn the program over to someone who we all know, uh, near and dear to our CMC hearts, uh, the Roy P. Crocker Professor of American Politics, Jack Pitney. Jack, thanks for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, in, in honor of uh, a uh, certain candidate for governor from Arizona, I have my background blurred. Uh, I, I, I have the touch up of the, uh, of the features. And uh, so I thought that would be uh, an appropriate way to start. Uh, and uh, I will spend most of the time during my presentation sharing the screen. So let me get started here. This is uh, about the 2022 election. And Representative Kelly Armstrong said, this is the weirdest election I've ever been a part of. And that is very much true. Uh, when you think about it, and uh, I know a bunch of you took my Congress class or my parties and elections class, and we talked about the, uh, the standard laws of elections. And this time, the fundamentals look really, really bad for the Democrats. I mean, think about it. Uh, number one, historically, the party holding the White House has tended to lose seats in a midterm election. Second, uh, President Biden's approval rating was well under 50 percent. Third, you had pretty serious inflation. You had the hangover from the Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, gas prices, a whole bunch of other problems. That was weighing the Democrats down. So you take all of these things into account. Uh, there's one political science formula that predicted that the Democrats would lose 44 seats. And that wasn't particularly controversial. There, a lot of people thought Democrats were on track to uh, to get clobbered, a, uh, a thumping to uh, use uh, President Bush's account of the uh, of the 2006 midterm or a shellacking, uh, which is how uh, President Obama described one of his midterms. So everything looked really, really bad for the Democrats. But instead of losing 44 seats in the House, they lost nine. They still lost control of the chamber. Uh, but uh, they beat the point spread. They also maintain control of the Senate and they have about half of the governorship. So all told, uh, the Democrats uh, came away from this election pretty happy. In particular, uh, the Senate races provided a lot of unpleasant surprises for Republicans, pleasant surprises for the Democrats, in part because in Senate elections, much more than House elections, candidates matter. Uh, in House elections, a lot of times people don't even know who's running. Senate elections, people have a better idea of who's running. And uh, even Mitch McConnell said, well, this was a problem of candidate quality. And, uh, you know, cocaine Mitch might not be your cup of tea, uh, but he's a pretty smart guy when it comes to elections and candidate recruitment. And he proved to be right. So if you look at some of the close elections, uh, this is uh, a comparison of the margins of uh, election eve polling averages versus what actually happened. Arizona, Senator Kelly, supposed to be a very close race. Eh, you know, it wasn't quite as close as people thought. In Georgia, <laughs> very famous race. Uh, Herschel Walker uh, had a slight lead in the pre-election polling average, and he ended up uh, behind on election night. Of course, that was unique. It went to a runoff that, as we know, he lost. Race after race, the Democrats outperformed expectations. Now, it doesn't mean they won every race. Um, uh, you had uh, Ohio, J.D. Vance uh, was ahead substantially. His victory margin wasn't quite as big as the polls indicated, but he still won by a pretty healthy margin. Uh, similarly, in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson uh, had a 2.8% lead, and that was closer than expected, but he still won. And uh, that was unusual, and that was a race uh, where Democrats at the start of the year thought they had a really good uh, opportunity to win. Candidate quality matters. Uh, 
again, uh, in uh, Georgia, uh, Herschel Walker, don't have to elaborate on his problems. Uh, any other uh, responsible Republican could have won that election, Doug Collins, uh, he would have won by a margin comparable to that by which uh, Brian Kemp won the governorship. Uh, and uh, in a couple of other states, it's likely that other Republicans uh, could have won, but they didn't. Uh, so that was a good outcome for Democrats. Uh, what accounts for this? Well, this was an unusual election uh, in this sense, and going back to the comment at the beginning. Uh, people tend to vote as a check and balance. Professor Bush uh, wrote a wonderful book on this called Horses in Midstream. I highly recommend it. Uh, and in a midterm, you vote to check and balance, usually by running for the party, not holding the presidency. This time, Democrats had an unusual opposition to cast themselves as the opposition party. Opposition to number one, Trump. Normally, the, the former president, the guy who lost the uh, the, after one term, isn't a factor. After Jimmy Carter was defeated in 1980, nobody was afraid that the, of the threat of Jimmy Carter coming back. Same thing with Bush 41. He lost, went home to Texas, you know, did the retirement and grandpa thing, and that was it. Uh, and then uh, he, he just wasn't a factor in future elections. This is different. Uh, Trump. Uh, refused to concede the 2020 election, is running again in 2024, and he is also unpopular. Uh, so the anti-Trump factor worked heavily in favor of the Democrats. Number two, uh, Supreme Court. Uh, we tend to think of, the, of Congress and the presidency as, quote unquote, the political branches. Well, things are different now. People see the Supreme Court as a political branch. Uh, in one poll, 63% said the Supreme Court is mainly motivated by politics. So we have to recalibrate our calculations as to what constitutes a check and balance. And lots of Democrats ran as a check on what they characterized as the Republican Supreme Court. Obviously, the Dobbs decision was crucial here. Dobbs was very unpopular. Uh, even people who uh, were opposed to abortion in a lot of circumstances, thought that decision went too far, and that worked to the benefit of the Democrats. And it mattered a lot more than pre-election polls suggested. Uh, if you went back in September, October, people ranked inflation as the top issue. Abortion didn't really uh, seem to matter as much early, but after the election, the polls indicated that it was very much on the minds of many voters. Uh, so all of these things, uh, very unusual, worked to the benefit of the Democrats. But, 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 Republicans won the aggregate vote for the House. Ah, that always happens. Uh, the, uh, uh, a little over 50% and change of the aggregate vote for the House went for Republican candidates. Uh, that's an indicator that Democrats uh, shouldn't get too cocky about this outcome. It's very likely that Republicans are very much in the hunt to maintain their majority in the House. We'll talk about that later. It's a 50-50 country and uh, Republicans won the aggregate vote in the House. They have about half of the uh, half of the governorships, if they had run better candidates, they probably would have taken control of the Senate. Uh, so Democrats uh, shouldn't rest easy. This was a competitive election and ultimately uh, an election that reflected a divided country. But nevertheless, they did a lot better than they expected. So uh, final score. Uh, the House is 222 uh, Republican to 212 Democrat. Uh, one vacancy from Virginia, almost certainly uh, to return to the Democratic hands after a special election. So essentially it's 222 to 213. Uh, Republicans uh, can only lose four votes only uh, in order to uh, prevail on a roll call. That is a very narrow margin indeed, as we saw in the speaker election that we'll talk about in a second. Senate 51D, 49R. And uh, in the last uh, Congress, 
Democrats had nominal control of the Senate, but with a 50-50 split with the vice president casting the tie-breaking vote, only took one Democrat uh, to throw sand in the gears. And that sand often consisted of Senator Sinema or Senator Manchin. They don't have nearly the same leverage that they did uh, just a few months ago. Obviously, the, uh, it's a fairly close margin, and a couple of senators can make a difference, but uh, their leverage is a lot less than it was. That's an important change. So why is this Congress different from other Congresses? Now we're moving from what happened in 2022 to what's likely to happen in the year ahead and beyond that. Divided government. Uh, in treatments in the press of divided government in the 80s uh, and, uh, and 90s, people would say, well, politics is all gridlock. Congress isn't very productive uh, because of divided government. There are whole books written on the phenomenon of divided government. But actually, uh, in the 20th century, divided government was often very productive. Uh, if you look in the 1940s, Truman ran against the do-nothing Congress, which is one of the most egregious uh, distortions in the history of political rhetoric. The so-called do-nothing Congress passed the Marshall Plan. They passed the National Security Act of 1947, which created the entire national security establishment, the Taft-Hartley Act, and lots more. Uh, you know, my I'm writing a book about uh, the Bush administration. Bush administration, among other things, brought us uh, the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, among the most consequential civil rights laws of all time. Uh, so divided government can be uh, very productive, uh, but in those days, in the 20th century, there were a couple of differences. Number one, Congress was a lot less polarized. Even in the 1990s, you still had a number of moderate to conservative Democrats uh, and a number of, you wouldn't call them quite liberal, but moderate Republicans. And usually the House majorities were more substantial. When you have a majority of only a few seats, uh, any small faction can exercise outsized influence again, as we saw. Second thing is, I'm thinking in particular of uh, the House Republicans. Uh, you know, people are saying, well, House Republicans are more divided than ever. Well, in some respects, the conflicts are uh, more intense than before and the stakes are higher. But uh, reality check, uh, Republicans have always been factionalized. As a lot of you know, I worked for the House Republicans in the 1980s. I wrote books about them in the 1990s. They've always, always, always been factionalized. Uh, you had the, in the 1980s, you had the Gingrich faction. They, they hated the Michael faction. You had all kinds of different layers of factionalism in the House. The difference was, even in those days, they tended to keep the nasty side indoors. Um, I got to sneak into a lot of uh, meetings I probably had no business being in. And uh, you get to see them um, uh, with knives out, to, to use the movie term. Uh, but generally, in public, they were more cir circumspect about what they said uh, concerning each other. This is different. Uh, we have seen this uh, in comments on social media. We've seen it on TV, and we certainly saw it during the speaker vote. Can't resist showing uh, a moment where it also almost resulted in physical violence. back and to the left. Okay, so that was uh, Representative Mike Rogers going after Matt Gates. The cause of that particular confrontation uh, was Matt Gates, who on a late ballot uh, refused to vote for uh, Kevin McCarthy 
they uh, uh, later reached an accommodation and uh, the voting ended that night. But you could see how rough it got and uh, the C-SPAN cameras were present in the chamber to capture that confrontation. And you still have members uh, saying really harsh things about each other uh, and internal comments leaking. Uh, Vern Buchanan of Florida has, uh, uh, has been recorded saying uh, that uh, he thought that Speaker McCarthy betrayed him in the race for uh, Ways and Means Chair, which is something that normally doesn't get out in public, but this time it did. And you have a lot of other feuds. You have uh, Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who ideologically ought to be compatible, but have uh, a great deal of personal animosity between them. Uh, so you have a lot of factional fighting on the House side. Obviously, you have some of that on the Senate side, uh, but it isn't nearly as uh, visible, uh, in part because uh, Mitch McConnell is a very effective leader, and he uh, is a master at uh, keeping the troops uh, unified as much as possible and keeping most conflicts from bursting into public. Sometimes they have, but not nearly as much as the House. Uh, and this illustrates the point I like to make in both my Congress course and Gov 20 and the House and the Senate continue to be very different kinds of bodies. Well, uh, what's going to happen next? Um, you know, what's the agenda of this Congress? Spoiler alert, it's unlikely to result in the same kind of landmark legislation that we saw from other uh, periods of divided government. We're not going to see anything as uh, far reaching as the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Marshall Plan. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it will be very lucky for the president if he's able to continue the same level of aid to Ukraine. A lot of Republicans in the House uh, don't want to uh, continue that level of funding. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, what we are likely to see are, are one house bills. Now that's a phrase I picked up from my years working in Albany where you had divided government for long stretches of time. And a one house bill is a bill that uh, passes in either the house or the Senate and they know perfectly well it has zero chance of passing in the other chamber where the other party is in control. Uh, so there's gotta be a lot of message legislation but not a lot of actual you know, legislating. Uh, one thing that's in the news uh, today, the United States hit the debt limit. Uh, the administration, as uh, other administrations have in the past, will be able to uh, delay any kind of crisis through various accounting measures that uh, I don't pretend to understand, take accounting classes. And um, we uh, will probably reach the brink of default sometime early in June. Now, the political problem for Republican uh, for, for both sides is this. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the difference between shutdowns and default. If you were to ask the average citizen, that's not uh, a distinction they make. And they especially don't understand the idea of raising the debt ceiling. Uh, average citizens think raising the debt ceiling means increasing the debt. It, it doesn't, it means paying off the debt we've already run. Uh, but because of this common misperception, this is something that the out party and Democrats have done this too, uh, have uh, uh, been able to exploit in their rhetoric. Uh, this time with narrow majority, uh, a lot of feuding and factionalism in the house, a lot of uh, Republicans overtly saying that they're okay with uh, accepting the risk of default, uh, there is an outside chance it could happen. And how much worse is that going to be than a government shutdown? We've had government shutdowns in the past. And I was asking my class today, do, do you remember the 2019 shutdown? And nobody in the class remembered it, even though it was only three years ago. And it's the kind of thing even college students uh, would, uh, would find that's in their uh, historical memory. But they didn't uh, have any recollection of it. And uh, a government shutdown is serious. It uh, has a cost to it. It means uh, suspension of certain kinds of government services, which is uh, a significant uh, problem. Uh, but ultimately it's a problem we can get through. A debt default has never happened. 
Uh, and the world economy to a large extent depends on the full faith and credit of the United States government. And if that comes into serious question, that's economic shark NATO. So what's the relationship in the, uh, in the gravity of a government shutdown versus the debt default? As a lot of you know, I love to show old movie qu uh, clips and this clip from Ghostbusters illustrates how much worse a debt default is than a government shutdown. I'm worried, Ray. It's getting crowded in there, and all my recent data points to something big on the horizon. What do you mean, the big? Well, let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. According to this morning's sample, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. <coughs> That's a big Twinkie. We could be on the verge of a fourfold cross rip, a PKE surge of incredible, even dangerous proportions. Okay, well, uh, yeah, a default is a big Twinkie, indeed. Now, there's no congressional majority in favor of default. Uh, you know, it's not as if uh, if you had a uh, roll call vote, should we default? You're not going to get that. But the trouble is, uh, it might be very difficult. Uh, with divided government, polarization, factionalism in the majority party in the House, might be very difficult to get a majority to pass legislation averting it. Uh, what's the political likely uh, uh, political consequence of a default crisis or a shutdown? Both of them could occur. Uh, the answer is every time it's uh, we've had a shutdown or we have come close to default, we've never crossed into the abyss. Uh, people have tended to blame it on the Republicans. 1995-96 uh, shutdown with uh, Clinton. Uh, actually, the shutdown occurred when Bill Clinton vetoed legislation, uh, the, the continuing resolution that would have kept the government open. He didn't like the Republican conditions. People blame the Republicans. Tw uh, 2011 debt crisis, people blame the Republicans. Uh, the partial shutdown a few years ago, not nearly as serious in its uh, political consequences, but people blame the Republicans in part because uh, President Trump very unwisely during a session with uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi openly said he was willing to have a shutdown. That was not something that his staff scripted for him and that worked against him. Uh, so politically, uh, this is a big danger for the Republicans. Uh, so why are they getting close to the abyss? Well, one reason is very few members have a great deal of historical firsthand memory. Uh, it, take the uh, 2011 shutdown crisis, the Tea Party, they're uh, wonderfully described in a book called uh, uh, Do Not Ask What Good We Do by Robert Draper. Uh, only about a quarter of Republicans uh, who are currently serving were around then. And if you go back to the 95, 96 shutdown fiasco, uh, only four, only four House Republicans were around for that. So they literally don't have the historical uh, historical memory. Okay, uh, uh, they're talking a lot about investigations and oversight of a variety of issues. If you look, however, at the composition of the House uh, Oversight Committee uh, announced just yesterday, you have Lauren Bo Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, basically uh, uh, the people who starred in the speakership controversy, some of whom were involved in the events of January 6th, and Democrats are rejoicing. Uh, they think these people are immediately going to overreach. They're not going to handle the investigations well. Uh, it'd be one thing if uh, the uh, House Oversight Committee consisted of a whole bunch of people who were uh, uh, Benoit Blanc, uh, people who really knew how to get to the bottom of things, but they're not. And Democrats are pretty happy uh, about how this is, is likely to turn out for them. Uh, and uh, I think it's a shame because there are a lot of serious issues that deserve serious oversight. Border security, serious issue needs oversight. Afghanistan, that was a huge mess. We ought to have investigations as to what lessons we can learn. Uh, but uh, we don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, will investigations have a major political impact? 
uh, if you look historically, there are some that have. Look at the Watergate hearings, they had an impact, uh, but most haven't. Take Fast and Furious. Now, unless you're a, a political junkie, you're gonna associate that with a certain movie franchise, not with a, a series of congressional hearings. Now, that was a scandal uh, about uh, a botched effort at investigating firearms. Again, very serious issue, very big problem. Uh, but it just simply did not move the dial as far as public opinion was concerned. Other things are unknowns. We don't know what the state of the economy will be over the next couple of years. Uh, we don't know what foreign crises will arise, will arise. And there are disasters to be announced. The unknown unknown, as uh, Donald Rumsfeld once put it. Uh, if we were having this discussion uh, early in uh, 2020, we probably wouldn't be talking about COVID yet. Uh, so who knows what other things are going to occur to upset the chessboard. Uh, but uh, as it stands now, it doesn't seem likely that Congress is, uh, is going to uh, have uh, a lot of progress on serious issues. And so I will conclude my uh, 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 scripted remarks uh, again with another movie clip. And I think Mr. T put it best in describing the 108th, uh, 118th Congress. What's your prediction for the fight then? Prediction? Yes, prediction. Pain. Okay, if I could predict anything for the 118th Congress, I would agree with Mr. T, pain. And with that, uh, I want to leave lots of time for Q&A and comments. So there we are. All right, thank you. And we have Mark Schwartz already with his hand raised. Everyone feel free to virtually raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom uh, that says, uh, you can click it and um, it says reactions. And on the reaction tab, you can say raise hand, and then it'll put you in the queue like Mark and then Christine. You can also put the question in the chat, and I will ask um, the question, your question of Professor Pitney. So with that, Mark, we'll send it off to you first, and then Christine. Um, thank you, Professor Pitney. Um, I want to advance the conversation to 2024 and ask you how the fight for the speakership and the impending um, debt crisis will impact both the presidential election in 2024 and more interestingly, what happens in Congress and whether or not there'll be a change of party control in the House of Representatives and what may happen in the Senate? I think that's a great question. As I said, given how many unknown unknowns there are, uh, I, I hesitate to, to make any firm predictions about the outcome. Uh, one thing, uh, one scenario, however, that is plausible, and I emphasize plausible, I'm, I'm not making a prediction, is that we have, we'll have the unusual situation where uh, Republicans regain control of the Senate at the same time that Democrats regain control of the House. I think that is totally plausible. If you look at the map, uh, you know, the, uh, the political pundit types say, look at the map. And it really is uh, a bad map for Democrats. They have to defend a lot of seats. Uh, and some of them like Montana, John Tester, uh, it, his seat is up again. And he's, he's done a terrific job of holding on to, a as a Democrat, holding on in a Republican state, but uh, you can't count on that uh, luck continuing. Very possible that Republicans will regain the Senate. Uh, on the House side, uh, a lot's uh, you know a lot's going to depend on exactly how the debt crisis shakes out. Uh, if we approach default, uh, I, I I'm hoping we don't go over the edge. But if it's like uh, 2011, the markets will go down. Uh, there's going to be a political price in the short run. And it could trigger a recession. Now that's the uh, the tricky part. Uh, Democrats uh, will have the advantage over Republicans in 2023. But if we have a recession, recessions tend to work against the party in power. So that's going to be bad for the Democrats. Uh, another unknown is Joe Biden's plans. 
being a senior citizen now, I, I, have, uh, I have immunity to talk about this, uh, but uh, he's of a certain age and let's face it, he's lost a step or two. And we don't know how, um, how ready he is to uh, run a campaign in uh, 2024. A uh, lot's going to depend on the Republican side. I'm thinking, you know, Democrats uh, are kind of hoping that the uh, Republican nominee will be Trump because a lot of Repu a lot of uh, voters don't like Trump. Uh, a big question, and I don't know the answer to this, and I'd be happy to hear from people who have uh, firsthand knowledge of Florida. How how well will uh, Ron DeSantis travel? He's been tremendously successful in the state of Florida, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking of um, other candidates, uh, other governors who've been very, very successful in their home state and uh, were total flopperoonies when they ran for president. Does anybody remember Bobby Jindal? Uh, you know, very po popular, successful governor of Louisiana, you know, and uh, it was the sad trombone when he ran for president. So. As the former president likes to say, we'll see what happens. All right, Christine, go ahead. Jack, good to see you. Thank you for doing this. I am, I'm curious your thoughts on, is there anything that moderate Republican congressmen can do to keep the extreme rank wing of Republicans in Congress under control? I think that's a great question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, this, this relates to several senior theses I've, uh, I've supervised in, uh, in recent uh, semesters. And I think the, uh, the number of uh, closet moderates is actually uh, fairly substantial, but two words primary voters. If you are a Republican, you might have inclinations, you know, it might be pretty conservative, but you're, but you want to be a practical problem solver. And that sometimes means working with Democrats on certain issues. You work with them on certain issues, you pose them on certain others. Uh, and, and that's legislative life. Uh, trouble is, uh, what we saw in the primaries in 2022 is that there is a price to be paid for us straying from the party line. Uh, take uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, as a lot of you know, uh, personal connection, I work for her dad. Uh, you know, Liz Cheney is not exactly a rhino communist socialist pinko. Uh, like her father, she has one of the most conservative voting records in Congress. But on the impeachment issue, she broke party lines and that was enough for Republicans to uh, toss her from the leadership, replace her with Elise Stefanik who actually had a much more liberal voting record before. Now Stefanik has, uh, has kind of changed her, uh, uh, her ideological stripes. Uh, so it's really tough. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, I see a, a chat question about the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, I th there are, is a certain level of issues, and I talk about this in my, my class this week, where uh, if there isn't a lot of public attention, you can have some quiet cooperation between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it's definitely true on disability issues. A, a lot of you know I study disability issues, autism in particular. And yeah, there uh, you I can talk for the next hour about uh, recent times where Republicans, Democrats have joined hands on disability issues. Uh, but the trouble is on something as high profile like the debt ceiling or uh, the speaker vote or uh, uh, you know, anything involving Trump, uh, that's where the base is watching and that's where uh, retribution would come in the primaries. Uh, so I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't. I have a follow-up for you. What are your thoughts on the Republican congressmen who are election deniers? Okay, well, uh, we, we may have minors watching this, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and uh, so I, I will be restrained in my language. Um, 
my, my attitude on, on election denial is, I, I would say I, I, my, elect, my attitude would be critical. I'll leave it there. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to the chat and then we'll go to Brian from Panama. Uh, in the chat, we have what role from, from John Garcia, what role do you see the Tuesday group, moderate Republicans playing in the house? Yeah, the Tuesday group has been around for decades. They've done a lot of good work. And again, they're moderate by Republican standards. Uh, you know, uh, if they were Democrats, they'd be considered really, really conservative. Uh, but these are the folks who are uh, very practical, very focused on uh, the details of policy. And on that level of practical problem solving, on the, the level that doesn't get uh, the headlines on cable news, uh, yeah, there's a lot of effort, uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity to work on things uh, such as uh, reforming the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, again, to take uh, something I uh, have studied. Uh, but I, I don't think there's much opportunity for them uh, to have a high profile role because even they, uh, even when they represent relatively moderate uh, districts in the Northeast or the Midwest, uh, the primary electorate is very different and there is only so far that they can go. Thanks, Jack. Brian, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Sure. Um, Jack, we, we are all well aware and you certainly well aware that, that there is a healthy group of disgruntled, disenfranchised and former Republicans who still exist in 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 the political world uh but but as we as we look forward uh i i'm just curious about your thoughts on on what impact they might have or if they can have an impact or if they're instead just going to remain wandering in the desert for 40 years um because they they there, there are things happening. We have the new forward party and, and so on. But I, I suspect that uh, a, a good number of them, if not, if not the, a strong majority of them, uh, feel like they they still have no home. And, and so I'm just curious what, what impact you think they might have uh, and what options might, might come to exist in the short future or, or medium future. Uh, a great question. And again, I expect some of you have taken my party's class. Uh, trouble is, it's really, 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 really hard to start a third party in the United States. Uh, it was a lot easier in the 19th century, uh, but now we have uh, a whole thicket of election laws, campaign finance laws that, that really entrench the two party system. Uh, there are a lot of reforms that might come to pass down the line uh, uh, that is ranked choice voting. Uh, that might be an avenue for a viable third party, but uh, I don't see ranked choice voting going statewide in a lot of places anytime soon. Uh, it uh, had some impact in Alaska this past year. Uh, but I, I don't think at least in the next election or two, uh, the the never Trump folks are going to have a third a viable third party alternative, and uh, when it comes to a percentage of the electorate, I mean the true hardline never Trumpers are actually a fairly small group, uh, you know, people who are very active on social media and uh, the mass media. When it comes to the general electorate, not so much. There are a lot of uh, there, there's a certain fraction of Republicans who are. Uh, uneasy with certain aspects of the party. But in the end, if you look at the exit polls, uh, uh, over 90% of them voted Republican. Uh, that's probably not going to change anytime soon. Uh, so any change from Trump is going to be uh, uh, a matter of evolution rather than any abrupt change in the next election. All right, thank you. We'll turn it over to Ada and then we'll jump to the chat. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that the Michigan electorate this last election cycle um, signed petitions and was successful in getting people to vote to ban gerrymandering. Do you, it, the result was a lot of Democrats got elected. Do you see that as a viable option in any more states? 
Well, the whole uh, the whole issue of gerrymandering is, uh, of course, familiar to a lot of you who worked at the Rose Institute. Uh, I suspect we have a lot of uh, Rose alumni in, in the audience. And um, uh, Democrats were a lot more successful with districting this time uh, than they had been in the past. Uh, with the caveat that uh, uh, in some cases, gerrymandering is deliberate. In other cases, it is uh, uh, a product of so-called unintentional gerrymandering. That is, Democrats tend to cluster in cities. And uh, you get a lot of districts that are 80, 90% Democrat which means you have a lot of wasted votes. And it doesn't really matter how you draw the lines. Uh, as I like to tell my classes, you could fire a cannon down Wilshire Boulevard and not hit a Republican. Uh, that's how, uh, how democratic uh, that area is. So gerrymandering is part of it. And again, Democrats were successful, although ironically, one reason they didn't take control of the House was a state in which they did control the districting process, and that is New York. The trouble is they got greedy. Uh, instead of drawing a, uh, a lines where they had a nice majority, they tried to basically repeal the Republican Party, and the court said no. Uh, as a result, the new lines were much more favorable to uh, to Republicans than the uh, what the Democrats could have drawn, and that's how we got people like George Santos, uh, and. Um, uh, so I think there is uh, a possibility for uh, additional gerrymandering reform, uh, although, uh, uh, again, this, uh, this cycle, uh, the lines uh, ended up uh, being much more reflective of the electorate than, than they had been in the past. Uh, we had two people. You you mentioned New York, and that's where I'm going with this next question. Uh, two people mentioned George Santos, one who is within uh, the Santos district in New York, uh, and one uh, who's referencing Peggy Noonan's article from today's Wall Street Journal. What should Republicans do with Santos? How did both Democrats and Republicans miss uh, this in the vetting process? And how does um, the issue at hand impact the House? Uh, yeah, this is a this is a great question. I know some of you have a lot of firsthand knowledge of this. Uh, I, I saw uh, in the participant list at least one uh, former op uh, one opposition researcher. Uh, somebody does this professionally. Uh, the uh, on the one hand, uh, there was some good opposition research. They did dig out a lot of the facts of Santos's life, not everything, certainly not uh, the uh, as yet unconfirmed story about uh, his uh, uh, theatrical performance in Brazil, but um, a lot of the financial stuff, yeah, they knew it. The trouble is in the New York metro area, you don't have as much local coverage as you did before. And this is a nationwide problem, a decline in local journalism. Uh, as you know, I talked to the press a lot a lot of the people I used to talk to aren't in journalism anymore. And that's, uh, that, that's something that's happened nationwide. Uh, and so the, uh, the major papers in the New York metro area simply weren't interested in a single district in, uh, in Long Island. That was part of it. Uh, there's been reporting that uh, the uh, Republicans did have a vulnerability study that did reveal a lot of the problems. And again, they just sort of ignored it. They uh, looked, uh, uh, they averted their eyes and hoped it would go away. Well, it didn't. Now, what should they do about him now? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but based on what I've seen so far, I think there is a very high probability that he's going to be indicted for something before too long. Uh, and as far as political liabilities go, the latest one involves, believe it or not, uh, stealing money that a disabled veteran is trying to raise for an operation for his dying dog. Now, if you were trying to devise a scenario, uh, you know, if I, if I pose that to my Congress simulation, they would say, oh, no, no, that's too ridiculous. No, that's actually uh, the story about what he, I'll include the word allegedly, uh, but uh, I think it's highly likely that he's going to be indicted, in which case he will have to go. 
in which case there will be a special election and uh, I'll defer to anybody who's in the area to, to tell me how the election will go, but that's not something that Kevin McCarthy wants in a very closely divided house. Switching gears to polling, when it comes to polls, who are they polling and how much should we trust them? That is a fantastic question. And uh, again, I've been doing this, uh, teaching a long time and the answer I would have given in 1987 is radically different than the answer I give today. In, 19, in the 1980s, when I talked about polling, some of you probably remember me talking about this. Uh, uh, I would describe random digit dialing and through random digit dialing, uh, you can reach a representative sample of the electorate where everybody has a roughly equal chance of being in the sample. Uh, and you can make reasonably good uh, predictions about how the electorate is going. Uh, but now, uh, this has changed everything. Uh, I don't know about you, when my cell phone goes off and I don't recognize the number, I don't pick up. Uh, and that's true. Most people now rely on their cell phones. Uh, lots of other problems involved. You know, there's been an explosion of telemarketing. People, uh, the response rates are abysmal, and the people who do pick up are different from the people who don't pick up. So, phone sampling is uh, is extremely problematic. Pollsters are trying to uh, compensate for that through online surveys. Trouble is, not everybody's online. Uh, my mother-in-law is downstairs here. My mother-in-law is not online, uh, so sample isn't going to include her. Uh, and there are a variety of, uh, of ways they try to, to hybridize this, some sample by phone, some sample by, uh, uh, by online survey. And as we saw in uh, the Senate elections, the results were generally within hailing distance of, uh, of the final outcome. But uh, there is, uh, in addition to the statistical error, the, the strong probability that uh, that the sample is just going to miss a lot of people. And there is, uh, I, I hate to keep uh, repeating this phrase, but there is no simple answer to that issue. And if you're in the polling world and you have the solution to the problem of low response rates, uh, you can make a lot of money. Bruce, um, Bruce Edmondson comments that, what do you think about the argument that the constitution requires public debts to be paid? Therefore, the debt limit is unconstitutional. Could the president issue an executive order that the debts must be paid? I uh, try. Uh, trouble is, I don't think the markets would buy that. Uh, what the uh, and the uh, the idea that the debt limit is constitutional has not been uh, tested in the courts. And if the president issued such a uh, executive order. It would probably take a long time for that case to reach the Supreme Court, in which case, uh, in, in the meantime, uh, the economy would still be in shambles. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, it, you know, it's possible that's an argument that the Supreme Court would buy, but um, uh, I don't think that approach, at least in the short run, uh, would be successful. Uh, follow up to Santos. Do you think this will drive New York to implement a recall mechanism? Uh, people will talk about that. Uh, again, this is a Gov20 thing. Uh, there, if you're in Cal if you're in uh, California, you're just used to the idea that we have the option for recall mm. in several states. A lot of states don't, and New York State does not have the recall. Uh, it do does not have voter initiatives. Uh, it, we have uh, New York. I, I start, started lapsing into the first person plural. I grew up in New York uh, uh, had, uh, and uh, has referenda only under very limited circumstances for uh, certain kind of measures coming out of the legislature. Uh, don't bet on it. If there's one thing that New York politicians don't want to do is uh, increase the chances that they can be booted out of office. Uh, and in any case, you could, uh, even in states that have the recall, you can't recall a House member or a senator. That would have to be done uh, probably by amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so I, I, I don't think New York is going to adopt a recall uh, process uh, anytime soon. And even if they did, it wouldn't apply to Congress. 
a question about primaries and open primaries from John Garcia. Uh, since there's growing concern over being primaried, do you think we may see more open primaries, which would allow for decline to state voters to have a stronger say? And more importantly, the extreme voices will be tempered. Uh, that was really the, uh, the idea behind uh, California's top two primary. Uh, which declined to state voters uh, can take part in. I'm a declined. I'm now a declined to state voter, and I can uh, vote in just about anything except uh, Republican presidential primaries. The um, trouble is uh, the experience we've had in California is even though uh, declined to state voters can go either way, and Republicans can vote uh, for a Democratic candidate in June, and vice versa. Uh, it turns out that people tend to stay in their silos. Uh, top two primary can yield uh, a moderate result in certain circumstances. And Professor Sinclair has done some really good research on this. Uh, but overall, uh, the Republicans and Republican identifiers stay in the REAP silo, the Democrats and the Democrat identifiers stay in the DEM silo. So it hasn't had the impact that it had. Uh, Schwarzenegger was really behind it. Uh, you know, uh, during his uh, last years of governor, he was like, We're dying at the box office. And this was his effort of trying to get more moderate Republicans uh, nominated. And it's it succeeded here and there, but by and large, it's fallen short of what its sponsors hoped for. Back to polling. In 2022, uh, Lita says, we really underpolled young voters whose main issue was the Dobbs decision. Is there any fix for this? Any fix in polling young voters? Uh, great question. And uh, uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of things. One, you have the broader issue I mentioned before about being cell phone dependent. Uh, young voters are even more uh, cell phone dependent than, uh, than geezers. Uh, I'm allowed to say that being over 65. Uh, and um, also, they, uh, I haven't seen data on this, but my hunch is they tend to be even more reluctant to answer uh, unknown callers. Uh, and when it comes to online polling, same thing. Uh, all my students are online pretty much all the time even when they're supposed to be paying attention in class, but don't get me started on that. Uh, and uh, consequently, they tend to be uh, even more leery of strangers trying to reach them electronically. Um, and again, I, I go, going to the mantra, I don't know what the solution to that is, but uh, it's not gonna be uh, uh, voice telephone polling, it's gonna be finding some way of reaching them. And that may necessarily involve some kind of incentive, take part in the survey and uh, you will have some kind of material incentive. That's gonna make it more expensive, but that might be what they have to do. I'd probably pick up my phone for an incentive of some kind. Um, Jonathan Medina, uh, would like you to comment on ranked choice and if that will continue to gain traction. He notes that, um, the Wall Street Journal piece recently mentioned a ranked voting scheme computer error just flipped an Oakland, California school board race. And I'm not sure about whether that's you know true or not, but um, he'd like you to comment on um, the way that ranked choice works and whether that is um, going to gain traction long term. OK, uh, I don't know if Nick Hydorn is on this call. If he is, he is a very important figure. He uh, uh, played a, a key role in bringing ranked choice voting to Oakland. Uh, in principle, I, I am, I've become a lot more favorable to rank choice voting. Uh, and I assign a book by Lee Drutman in my party's class. I, I think it has a lot of potential. However, and I, uh, there are practical problems and, and Jonathan pointed out one simply programming. Another one is if you have ranked choice voting across the spectrum of uh, offices on which people have to vote, that's putting a lot of burden on individual voters. It, it, you can see ranked choice voting for governor or ranked choice voting for senator. But if you get down to the uh, uh, 
to certain local offices, let's say uh, mayor of Saratoga Springs, uh, and uh, you know people might sort of uh, burn out after a while because people have to uh, do lots of calculations to see how they rank various candidates. Uh, so I think it's a uh, it's a potential uh, potentially useful tool for high profile offices. I'm not sure how well it would work across the board. And this is where na across national comparisons break down. Uh, the United States is unusual among countries in the number of things we just vote on. Uh, there are lots of other democracies in the world, but uh, in places like Canada or the United Kingdom, you vote for your member of parliament, you might vote for a couple of local offices, and you're done. In the United States, I mean, you're voting for Rancho Santiago Community College District. Uh, and uh, I mentioned before, some vets of Gov20 may remember this stat, more than half a million Americans hold elected office. Half a million, that's a lot. We vote on lots of stuff. Uh, so uh, anything that complicates the electoral process is potentially problematic. Thank you, Jack. We have hit five o'clock. Uh, we are going to uh, pause uh, this program. I encourage everyone to unmute, say hello, say goodbye, and say thank you. I also encourage all of you to uh, consider attending us for um, in Iceland, June 9 through 12. We also added a second boat for the Galapagos tour, our first boat filled up, which is uh, end of June, early July 2024. Another note will go out about that. Of course, we have some great programming coming up with Professor George Thomas in the Murdy Student Quantitative Computing Lab. We hope you attend those activities as well. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you soon. Feel free to unmute and say hello and goodbye.